Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about adding a new bow roller for the anchor, neatening up all the solar wiring, and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. This week turned out to be a good week for getting a whole lot of jobs done on Renko, but the week started out actually helping my mate Lorenzo with the rotten transom on his runabout. He wasn't in the position to cut the whole transom out and do a, you know, a 20 year fix on it, but we got in there, got as much of the uh, old rotten timber as possible and got it much stronger than it was. We're getting most of the soft stuff out. Most of the water's kind of out. I'm starting to get to the areas where it's actually a bit harder. I can't quite Put get in, in the there. Timber, yeah. So we've pretty much got about 70 or 80% of that out, which is good news. Uh, I'll get you chopping up as much of that yeah, glass as, possible, glass as we can. Yeah, pack the hell out of that. Traditionally, you'd probably cut the whole ass off and that's pull it. it out. Redo it. Wood, but you're yeah. really trying to get another season out of it, aren't you? Yeah, considering we've only really got that amount to go. Yeah. Plus all the brace bars and everything we're going to whack on this. Yes. Instead of it just hanging off the little holes, it's going to hang off that big chunk of American metal. So we're fine. I'll just keep digging. <laughs> I love your work. Oh, mate. <laughs> a little bit of gloves yeah, chopped up. Nice. Gloves. <laughs> yeah, right. So I reckon this consistency is what we're aiming for. Yeah, bigger the better, man. Yeah. Back at Lorenzo's boat this morning, the Tangerine Dream. Going to uh, finish with our chopped epoxies. This is as far as we got last time. Quite a bit of fiberglass and epoxy in there. Finish it off, top cap it. Let it dry. You feeling confident? Mate, like we said, it's a hell of a lot better. That, oh, totally. That, that engine, all 160 Whatever kilos, kilos of it, yeah, yeah. Was literally just hanging on glass. That yeah, was yeah no, no wood at all. Nothing yeah. else. Feels pretty yeah, solid, pretty doesn't good. it? Yep. I'm it's not an improvement. Make a one inch punch, but looking pretty good. <laughs> not going to go old Bruce Lee on it. <laughs> oh. Once we'd filled the cavity completely, we put a top cap of solid glass matting, the aluminium strip back on, an aluminium backing plate, and then got the boat in the water for a test drive. And on the test drive, we could see that all the flex that was there before was completely gone. So really happy with that. Once Lorenzo's boat was back in the water, I got onto Renko and started by installing an external aerial for the 4G modem. Here's the antenna I'm going with. Uh, spent the full $29.95 on eBay. See what difference it makes, if any. We'll do some before and after speed tests. We've got a few options for mounting it using this bracket or not, so we'll see what we've got on the mast. Here looks to be an old similar style of antenna, possibly for 3G, possibly a different radio frequency, I don't know. Um, bracket's a little bit booger welded on, but you know, it hasn't gone anywhere, so I presume it's strong enough. We could use here. The other option is this mast headlight is currently not connected in any way. We're using our all round white light because the boat's under 12 meters, so we can get away with that. Uh, down the track, I may do a full set of lights for, you know, restricted and ability to maneuver and all this kind of stuff as a stern light. But this is another option in the meantime, given this is not even connected to anything. Hmm, decisions, decisions. All right, let's take this off anyway and see how these holes lined up with our bracket we've got, whether we need to do any drilling. Okay, our right angle bracket is now a flat bracket. Obviously this conduit's been badly UV affected, so I'm gonna cut this and I'm gonna use this to pull the new cables through. I'm gonna try and pull these two through and some DC cables from here. Are they gonna interfere with each other? Who knows? Doesn't mean we have to use them, but now's the time to pull them through. Someone up, someone down would be awesome. But we don't have that luxury, so let's see how we go. All right, they're pretty tight. Once again, I don't know what it is. These are really sticky wires. 
I'm going to try and spray something down there to lubricate them to bring it through. Don't know how well we're going to be able to spray it. Having serious trouble getting these two wires down. And I'm thinking it's because there's four and it's the way the wires interact with each other on the way up. I think the only way I can get these two down is to disconnect the anchor light, the all-round white light that is working. That makes it feel a bit, you know, one step backwards to go two steps forward, which is fine. It's what you'll do, but uh, a little bit frustrating. Unfortunately, and what makes it worse, is that the hole the wires come through is like, you know, 20 mil across and the mast's about 75 mil in diameter. So if you push a wire down, there's no guarantee at all that you're gonna get anywhere near that hole. So do I push a string and use the, uh, you know, the vacuum cleaner technique to suck the string out? Might work that way. Everything fights you, that's for sure. All right, let's do it. My plan is to cut the anchor light attach the twin core wire to it and then just try and pull all four through all right this means we can pull all four oh, wish we can't okay so all we've got now is a broken masthead light and we're in no better condition. Unfortunately, in the end, I didn't have any luck even getting the old wires out of the mast. I don't know if they're bound up in something or it's simply the fact that they're really sticky. They've got this really sort of tacky coating to them now, unfortunately. So even when I tried to lubricate it and not have other wires being pulled in, just simply try and pull them out, they still just broke. So they're gonna be in there for a while. What that means is I'm gonna have to sort of ramp it up a notch and there's actually one section on the mast near the base that's quite rusted and needs pad welding to build up. So while it's already thin, I've decided I'm gonna drill through there with a hole saw, be able to hook the wires, get it all right, and then I'll just weld a new piece of metal in and it's done. So that's the plan, but didn't get to it this week. I did, however, go to an area of the river where there's very poor reception. You sort of get one bar flicking to SOS, so really on the limits of mobile reception. Without the aerial, I could still get one meg of download, which I thought was pretty good, one point something. But as soon as I plugged the aerial in, I got 10. So a massive improvement for a, literally a $30 antenna. I was really actually impressed. You can get better ones where the two antennas, instead of being in one unit, you separate them on the wheelhouse, which is better again. But I've got to say, for the price, it did a fantastic job. Anyway, time to push on with more jobs on Renko. Another little job I'm going to do now that's long overdue is cut the dipstick to the correct length. It was uh, aftermarket one, so it wasn't, you know, any set length. Finally, after lots of trial and error, I've figured out what is the correct level of oil, amount of oil in this engine. So let's go and do it. Oh, really? Bron just said she's seen another seal in the river. Just where you are now? I just like grabbed and it just went. Oh, really? It's huge head and I was like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Went for a dive on the wreck of the swan yesterday. Do a video on that soon. Okay, so oil comes about 28 millimeters above the full mark. So we're just gonna cut 28 millimeters off this end. All right, first thing I do is loosen the handle and then just confirm that it's all the way into the handle. Otherwise that may be a source of error for us. So just back it off. Yeah, it was all the way in, so that's good. Uh, left my parrot cutters at home, didn't I? Oh well, we should better do it with side cutters. So, 28 mil, about here. Oh, got it. Okay. 
back in, tighten up. Okay, a little bit of Loctite on it. So it doesn't come off on us. All right, that looks pretty good now. Nice, another job done. I'm really glad I put that aftermarket dipstick in because it comes up much higher. The factory one was really low down, sort of even behind the starter motor from memory. And because this is really easy to get in and out now, you you know, the oil will get checked more often. It's that simple because it's easy to do. So that's a worthwhile upgrade, I think. Anyway, it's also accurate now, so that's good. After feedback from viewers, much appreciated, I've taken the earth from the inverter and just gone straight to battery negative. I don't quite get why that's the deal because this is the negative for the inverter to get DC. So you then just have another wire coming out of the inverter going to the exact same place. Apparently it's a done thing, but it sort of makes me feel there's absolutely no need to have this extra wire because <laughs> it could just happen internally. Anyway, then what we need to do is we're gonna bond the battery negative to a single point and a single point only on the steel hull of the boat. Then uh, I think we're done with regards to our earths and negatives, but Ben's coming today and we're gonna add an RCD before our first load, which is a really important safety thing. So I either need to do something tricky here with these negatives, we've got our large posts and some smaller posts to make a bit of room, or we're gonna have to mount a second board. Don't get me wrong, I think a second board makes sense because we've already got this temporarily hanging off here for our water pump that uh, Jason gave me. And uh, I'm gonna get rid of that and put another little fuse panel here. So we've already got an ICD, a fuse panel, and I was talking to Ben about adding a 240 volt socket in here too, for maybe for like charging up Makita batteries, that kind of thing. So once again, the list grows. The only board I had left is this, which is the old rod holder from the green machine. So I think we're gonna repurpose this as our uh, extension electrical board. Now, when I put these on, I actually welded little tabs on and I don't have the welder here or any little tabs. So are we gonna do something temporary? Given Ben's gonna be here in about an hour, we're gonna stay classy and cable tie it on. I've decided my New Year's resolution for next year is gonna to be to attach something like that without saying that's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. All right, I'm gonna remove the uh, bolt from here people were dead right about it being a bad idea. Uh, current can damage bearings, current going into the water on a boat. Boats aren't like a house where you put your earth stake into the ground. It can actually be a risk to swimmers around the boat if that happens, if current goes into water that way. Excuse the head torch, I can't be bothered taking it off. We're gonna look at the engine after this. Uh, I need a place to attach it that's got a really good connection to the hull. So rather than attaching it to a bolt that might rust, I think I'm going to weld a bolt head onto the hull and attach it to that. It'll also end up being a neater install because we'll go from the negative bus bar in the lazarette to the bulkhead really close by. In the past, I was somewhat skeptical, but I'm starting to think swapping this uh, piston out in situ is possible. You don't have a lot of room to get your hand under the oil pan. Fortunately, I'm thin, so I can just get my hand in there. But you can get to all the bolts around the oil pan, drop it, and you can definitely slide it out. And then you're gonna have more room to get to the, the rod caps. So I'm thinking it's actually worth a shot doing it in situ right before we you know, lift the engine. Look, you can only try, if it doesn't work, lift it out. Anyway, let's have another look while we're here and see if I can, because obviously the engine stops in a different part of its stroke every time. So we might get more information, see if it's getting worse, getting better. So let's just grab a quick screwdriver and uh, give the rings a poke again. This piston stopped 
we can't see any of the rings. Oil there. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, they've got a bit of spring. So do they. You can definitely feel a bit of spring in those ones. Oh, maybe we just keep running it. Let's check the front ones. It's now got uh, 91 hours on it since the rebuild, I think. Getting up to its first oil change. I think uh, Adrian was saying um, 100 hours on the first change and maybe 200 after that. All right, this piston's all the way down. That ring's not stuck. So you can see carbon sort of coming down the side of that piston, I think, but I don't know. And he said, you know, there's a bit of rust here from what looked like a coolant leak, but I've got to say, it's quite, looks exactly like it was the first time, and it's quite hard. It's like whatever it was maybe happened and isn't happening anymore, but I can't wipe it off or anything, so it could have been there for quite a while. And it doesn't look any different. So maybe I'm not as worried as I was, to be honest. That's the update after 90 hours of running. While I was editing this, I noticed the inside of the airbox looks a little green. So I'll double check whether that's coolant or whether it's just an artifact of the torch and camera. The thing is, if it wasn't for the oil coming out the airbox drain and the exhaust, I'd be thinking this thing runs beautifully. You know, it really does. You touch the button and it starts, never misses a beat. It's actually been a really good engine other than kind of knowing there's a problem with it. Maybe it's just one of those little quirks that keeps us guys coming back. In a flash of mediocrity, I've just realized I can probably take this smaller uh, negative bus bar out, leave the one for the larger wires, and replace this one for the finer wires with the six fuse panel that I took out from the front when I upgraded to a 12. I reckon it'll fit where that is. And then because this has a negative bus bar at the top, I can use that for these wires. So I think that's gonna work. Let's do that. negative jumper onto our new fuse panel. Okay, positive down here. All right, let's go over to Brooklyn and get Ben. He's kindly uh, driven up from down south again to give me another hand. Ben's made good progress with the conduit for the solar cells there. It'll all look much neater by the time we finished. Oh. Which is great, thank you, Ben. And uh, yes, they're having lunch now. And Ben's also, if you can see with the glare, I am going to buy a glare screen for this, but uh, downloading Windows 10 so we can upgrade this from 7, which is no longer supported. Ben was doing a great job on all the wiring, so I uh, figured I may as well just go to the pub while he finished up. No, only joking. This one we want as long as possible, don't we? This yeah. pretty much ends. And then this one we're cutting quite short, is that right? This is our three inch one. Correct. Here's the uh, final result of mostly Ben's effort. So huge thanks to you once again, Ben, for both providing the bits and pieces and uh, doing the bulk of the work, having the idea, the technique. It's come out really nicely. This is the wire to the lights. This needs to be cut. 
uh, and have a removable connector put in because I need to be able to undo those MC4 plugs, undo this dual core and lift the awning off if ever the uh, engine needs to come out. So I don't want anything here hardwired. So one to neaten up and then we're in business. We now have a couple of sockets here. This is temporary. I'm going to replace this with a waterproof, you know, outdoor dual point socket, but it is protected by an RCD now. So this is now the lead that goes to the power board in the wheelhouse. So this is all protected now by the RCD coming from the inverter. I didn't show wiring all this stuff because I know people get a bit bored seeing wiring, 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 but at least you know now how it's set up. The last piece of the puzzle is these two wires go to my battery chargers that independently charge all five batteries. So they're nicely balanced with their charging and all that kind of stuff, which is great. The shore power for this boat is purely going to charge the batteries. If you want to use 240 volt, you run on shore power, that charges the batteries, the inverter still gives you 240. There's no way for me to get direct 240 to a power point from shore power. But that's okay, I'm happy with that. I don't think I'm gonna use it very often at all, to be honest with you. So, my question is, I have this sort of outdoor socket. Boats generally have a different style for marinas. I want something really sort of common that I can use just on the wharves around the island more than marinas. Originally, there was a socket like this on the wheelhouse here. Great spot for it, under the awning, and available you know all the time you could leave it leave the boat tied up locked up and it could be there but my question is do i put it here so yes you'd have to have the lazarette hatch chocked open 20 mil to have a power cord coming in but it means that i can go from this straight to a second RCD and a galvanic isolator. I could have the socket on the wheelhouse and have the RCD in the galvanic isolator here. My only concern is whether that length of run from there to here is a potential sort of uh, chance to have a fault before we get to any of our devices to protect the boat and the people. So advice appreciated there. If I can get away with the RCD here and the galvanic isolator here and the socket up there, I think that's the best. Otherwise, I'm gonna put them all here. This board attaches to the hull via a angle bracket that's welded straight onto here. Inside's not painted. I'm gonna put our earth strap essentially. This is the only place that the hull is bonded to the negative battery terminal. Every device has its own negative return, but this means that should a positive touch the hull, it can find a way back to battery negative, blow a fuse because it can flow high current rather than finding some weird path we don't want it to find. My understanding is this is the done thing. You can have an entirely unbonded system, very, very hard to achieve. And if you can't achieve it, have it attached to the hull, but in one place only. I am going to weld a bolt to the hull when I get the welder back on board to fix the aft deck but for now I've put it here. I've got a bit of length so that we can uh, shift it when that happens, if we need to. Let's test continuity between the hull and battery negative now. All right, let's go battery negative and then the hull here. Yeah, less than one ohm, so that's good. We'll monitor that over time. Another test I'm gonna do now is the uh, silver half cell test, which is a way of testing whether you got too much or too little anode. I think it's kind of worth doing now that we've got this bonded hull as well. All right, to do this, we are going to use this bit of silver. I got that on the internet from, uh, I think it was a jewelry supply place or something maybe. And we are gonna attach this to our negative. into the water. This is just a push on alligator clip for these banana plugs. All right, let's let that dangle in the water for a little while to start reacting with it. And then we're gonna measure the voltage between that and 
a bonded fitting right here. We've got a stainless cleat that's welded to the hull. All right, now we're gonna go to bolts DC and we're on the smallest scale. Touch the terminal onto this little cleat and we have, what do we have? 0 0.98, 1.02 or minus. Mine, essentially minus one volt. Fluctuating a little bit between it. But 1.02 seems to be the most common reading I'm getting. All right, let's see if that's good or bad. There's a few different charts around the place, but this one is saying more positive than negative 0.7. So if it had been negative 0.6, saying you pretty much have no protection. Uh, negative 0.7 to 0.8 is inadequate protection. Then it's saying between negative 0.8 and negative 0.95 is adequate protection, uh, but negative 0.95 to negative 1.0 is the range we're in. It says uh, adequate protection, but it's in the high range, not recommended for aluminium boats. So I think we're okay, but we need to be careful. So I think we've got the maximum anodes we can put on because it says more negative than minus 0.05 and you're overprotected. And in that case, you can actually start building up material on the hull, which will start peeling your paint off and causing rust. So, so we're sort of at the high end. Uh, it's kind of good, I think. I think we're in a good sweet spot for a steel boat. Uh, too high if we were aluminium. And if we had two more on, I would say we'd be definitely over and we'd have to remove anodes to not be causing damage. So, seems good. Quite a beautiful little spot to uh, sit and finish the wiring that Ben and I started yesterday. Yesterday, Ben and I were going to run a whole lot of wires down through the air intake for the engine bay and we sort of rushed at the end to get them all sort of connected together but I've since thought about it and for example we've got this problem the Detroit I need to be able to take this awning off without too much trouble so I'm going to put a junction box here with PV connectors so that I can unplug everything take the awning away and then put it back on plug it back in so nothing's hardwired so let's get on connect all these up in the junction box and then run it down. It's only halfway through spring and uh, I've just been reminded how keeping the box of heat shrink here for half an hour and it's already starting to kind of shrink in the sun so got to remember to keep it in the shade. Got neighbours now, there was no one here when we got here. I've used a little bit of uh, dual wall heat shrink here just to expand the cable size enough so that the rubber grommet that comes with the MC4 connector will uh, seal well around it, otherwise it was a bit too thin. Another thing worth noting with these MC4 or PV connectors is that this is actually a female and this is the male. The pin inside this one is this type of pin and the pin in here is a socket. So externally they look opposite to what they actually are. So these females I'm doing as the positives and they look more like they've got this pin. All right, all connected now. Two banks of three cells in parallel. Got the connectors. At the very last minute, I swapped this project box to this size from the one larger and I'm so wishing I hadn't done that. I might be able to squeeze them in, particularly with the height of the case, but it's not gonna be good. Next job is long overdue and that is to get the bowsprit here set up to accept the Rockner anchor. What I have here is a bolt-on bowsprit, bow roller, that uh, comes from Savwinch. A couple of rollers to hold the shank of the anchor and lots of different mounting holes depending on, you know, how your boat's set up. So you've got plenty of options. I'm thinking we'll probably only use four of them to start with, but uh, we can always add more down the track. All right, step one, let's get the Rockner out of the way and unbolt the existing bow roller. Sit there for now. Might as well keep all this together. You never know. The dome nut for this roller hits, but I think an ordinary nut might just fit. Let's try that. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I think we can buy ourselves a bit of space. Hope it's metric. Because I think all these nylocks are. Yes, nice. being boarded by pirates. Eddie and his crew. Finish work, come on Ed. Oh, it was on earlier. Oh, this morning? Yeah. Good to see you. You've been keeping out of trouble? No, you never do. All right, let's mark these holes. My thinking, is if we drill here and here, we can slide it back one if we want to, snug it right in there, which could be nice. But if there's any issue with the bow, we've also got one set forward as well. So we've got three positions we can try if we drill that way. That's four bolts, but we could easily put another another four. These are borderline, but possibly another six. Actually, no, we could. We could put six more in if we need to. Might just swap this mooring to the other side. Oh, current's going now. Easier said than done. It's not right. The ultimate test really is does it self-launch and once it has gone all the way so the chains on that roller I think chain is going to hit here so we may need to do a bit of a tweak to stop that happening too yep it's going to self-launch which is awesome and I'll give it a test out in the water away from the mooring line so we don't get all tangled up Nice. Oh, well, that's a good start. I've got this outdoor marine cigarette lighter socket. I may as well pop it in here. We had the two taps here. I've got the USB charger on one side, waterproof. Let's put the cigarette lighter socket on the other. That way they're both blocked off and got a bit of power. You never know when it's going to come in handy. This uh, rubber cap to seal it off also goes right around the back as a rubber grommet behind it. Should seal well. Just going to put some rivets in these little holes to block them up for now. They're aluminium rivets, so they'll be easy to drill out later if I decide to because uh, here is actually going to go a really small, slim cabinet that doesn't really come out much past here. for holding a few bits and bobs that live out here. Possibly even, uh, you know, flares, that kind of stuff that you use on the deck only. The last hole here I don't have any plans for yet. I'll have a think. If I can't think of anything, I'll just blank it off. The last job on Renko was to fix the broken hangers for the steering hydraulic lines got these broken plastic ones out uh, let's just get a couple of the metal ones in because I've got to go pick Pete up now this afternoon we're going to pull the heat exchangers uh, well at least the heat exchanger off the Vetus that's not working at the moment so we can keep one engine going get that fixed then maybe do the other one straight after I guess got these little rubber grommets around the uh, copper pipe too which is nice just a bit of cut fuel hose or something by the looks of it All right, let's go get Pete and get on with these heat exchanges. Even with just those two, it's heaps better than it was. It was just hanging before. All right, let's duck over to the mainland and grab Pete. All right, we're going to drop this anchor here, just to have a little test. 
My only worry is chain and rope still hitting here, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. All right, Pete, hit the down button. <laughs> This is what we need to stop. It's all right, let it out, but it's definitely hitting there. Go in reverse. Yeah, just bring us back a bit, yep. Yeah, let out till we get to the rope. All right, that'll do. Yeah, we're gonna need something. Could we drill? I think this roller needs to be here for um, the shank of the anchor to sit in the nook of that so that it self launches, which is awesome. But we're gonna have to sort something out here. We could cut this back a bit. I think that's all it would actually take is to cut this flush with here. Pretty simple solution, should work fine. One thing I want to talk about before we do, great thing about the chain at the top, UV protects the rope underneath, but in here is the tow rope we bought for Pete's uh, tow of his Halverson, which we're heading out to now. And if I grab a bit, looking at these two ropes, this is nylon and the braking strain was 4.9 tonnes. This one here is a double braid, and it's actually made out of Dyneema, and the braking strain of this anchor road here is 10 tonnes. So, my concerns about anything happening with it are definitely gone. And the great thing about having a really strong, thin rope is you can fit lots of scope onto the winch. All right, let's winch this in and uh, go out to Whitecrest. Let's do it, up we go. What I do want to do is mark these uh, chain links so I know when the anchor's about to pop up. <laughs> Every five meters. Yeah. Uh, uh, That's there my it is. For an adventure. Ah, look at that. Oop. That'll do. Uh, okay. It's a bit tense, that. Yeah, there. Looks about right there, doesn't it? Yeah. All right, very good. So it spools really nicely, even without anything on it. The only downside then I noticed is that it ended right near an edge which is why I was pulling a little bit sideways, but uh, just get the angle grinder out and it uh, should be perfect. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, really happy with the things that happened this week. Huge thanks to Ben for coming up and helping me neaten up the wires for the solar cells. You know, they just look 100 times better. They're really well protected. The runs are now actually shorter because they've all been sort of trimmed down to the minimum to fit in. So really, really happy with that. Really happy with the whole anchoring setup now. The sav winch, drum winch just works so well with the trawlers, you know, it just, the combination of that bow shape, the deck, it, it just, it always feels like it's sort of made for it. So I'm really glad I went with a drum winch. The Rockner's a great anchor too, and now having it on that sav winch, you know, bow roller, bow sprit, it's self-launching, it retrieves nicely. Just got to fix that, that bit where the chain hits. Cutting it will probably do. Other option is to swap to feeding from the top of the drum, which will definitely clear it, but I'd rather keep it low if I can. So we'll try cutting it. If that doesn't work, I'll put a, another roller to guide it over and I'll probably get some sort of convex rollers. You get those ones that help guide a rope onto a drum to spool it. So, you know, that could be a really nice setup if we need to do it. In the end, Pete and I did get the heat exchanger off the Vetus. Uh, this video is already getting pretty long, so I'm gonna put that in the next video. Because the part for the Vetus heat exchanger is quite expensive, I'm thinking what we might do is look at installing some sort of generic heat exchanger. Just finding a unit, either making or finding a unit you can buy cheaply, that is just, you know, salt water in, salt water out, coolant in, coolant out. I mean, that's all they are. The water just goes through four pipes with um, hose clamps on them, you know? So very, very easy to swap it to something that's not a genuine Vetus part. And there's loads of space. It's not like it's going under the cowling of an outboard where it's got to really fit in a bespoke way. This, you know, we can just have it off to the side and should work, can't see why not. You know, the thermostat ultimately is setting the uh, temperature the engine runs at. So as long as it's got enough cooling capacity, it should run well. 
Anyway, that's a project coming up in a future video, so take care and we'll catch you soon. See you. It's too late to be out. Daisy knows it's bedtime. Oh. Come on. Daffy. It's getting dark. Daisy's got it. Oh, well done. See the things you can do when there's food involved. <laughs> like a version of running. You know the shortcuts to flying and jumping when there's food, don't you? There you go, there's plenty of seeds in there too, not just worms. Eat your grains. All right, I'll leave you to it. It's getting late. See you tomorrow.